Hi, welcome to How Can the Measured Number of Neutrino Species Be 2.9963 Plus or Minus 0 0.0074? Okay, so in the standard model of particle physics, there are three types of neutrinos. There's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And all three of those neutrinos have been discovered. However, the standard model might not be a complete theory of nature. So how do we know there aren't more types of neutrinos? So it makes sense to experimentally determine how many species of neutrinos there actually are. Okay, so here we'll look at the experimental determination of the number of light neutrinos. And here light means that they have masses less than about 45 GeV over C squared. And toward the end of the video, we'll see where that number comes from. Okay, so the measured number of light neutrinos is 2.9963 plus or minus 0.0074. Now, this might bring to mind some questions. Namely, doesn't the number of neutrino species have to be an integer? Can't you just count them? And how is this result possible? So we'll answer those questions in this video. So here are the papers on which this video is based. First, we have the original experimental result from 2006. And also we have two recent papers that go through a reanalysis of certain systematic uncertainties in the original experimental result. If you're interested, you can check out these papers by following links in the description below. Okay, so let's briefly review the particle content of the standard model. The standard model has six types of quarks, the up, the down, the charm, the strange, the top, and bottom. And each one of those quarks has an antiparticle, which is denoted with the same letter, but with a bar on top. Next, there are six types of leptons. There's the electron, the muon, the tau, and their three neutrinos, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Each one of the leptons also has an antiparticle. So in the case of the electron, its antiparticle, the E plus, is also called the positron. And in the case of the mu and the tau, we'll just refer to their antiparticles as the mu plus and tau plus. Antineutrinos, however, are denoted with a bar over them. Okay, next, there are also the gauge bosons of the standard model. So that's the Z, the W plus and minus, the photon, and the gluons. And finally, there's the Higgs boson. Okay, so the gauge bosons, the Z, the W plus and minus, the photon, and the gluons, they mediate forces between particles. What will be particularly relevant here are the interactions between the Z and the quarks and the leptons. But first, let's take a closer look at the quarks and leptons of the standard model. Okay, so the quarks and leptons are arranged into three generations. These three generations are seemingly identical except for the masses of the particles in them. So, in the first generation, we have the up and down quarks, which are the lightest of the six quarks. And also we have the electron, which is the lightest charged lepton. In the third generation, we have the top and bottom quarks, which are the heaviest of all of the quarks. And we have the tau, which is the heaviest charged lepton. And in the second generation, we have the middle weights, the charm quark, the strange quark, and the muon. Now, you might have noticed that I didn't say anything about the masses of the neutrinos, and that's because we don't know the masses of the neutrinos very well. 
What we do know is that the masses of the neutrinos are very small, so less than one electron volt over c squared. And the neutrino masses are far, far smaller than anything else on this slide. So the next lightest particle on this slide is the electron, and it has a mass of 511 kilo electron volts over c squared. Okay, so why has nature made three identical copies of the quarks and leptons? At least identical except for their masses. We don't know. And additionally, we don't know for certain that there aren't additional generations of quarks and leptons that we just haven't discovered yet. So why might there be more generations of quarks and leptons that we don't know about? Well, the heavier a particle is, the more energy you need to produce it. So if there are more generations, but the particles in them are heavy, discovering them is much more difficult. You need larger accelerators and you need more complicated analyses. So this might raise some questions. So first, if there are more generations, do those generations have neutrinos as their lightest particles? Now this doesn't have to be the case, but since it's what we observe in the three generations that we know about, we might speculate that further generations would show the same behavior. And second, could those neutrinos be light enough to be produced in colliders we've already built? So it makes sense to see if there are additional species of light neutrinos beyond the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino that we already know about. Now, I should note that in this video, we're only talking about possible new neutrinos that act just like the standard model neutrinos. So they have the same interactions as the standard model neutrinos. If you've heard anything about neutrino experiments, you might have heard of sterile neutrinos. Sterile neutrinos don't interact in the same way as the standard model neutrinos do. So we're not talking about scenarios like that here. Okay, so the experiments that made this measurement were called Aleph, Delphi, L3, and Opal. And that's sometimes abbreviated as ADLO. These experiments were located at LEP, which was the Large Electron-Positron Collider at CERN. LEP was an E plus E minus, an electron-positron collider, that operated from 1989 to 2000. And it was located in the tunnel where LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is now located. Now for this measurement, ADLO used data collected when the electron and positron were collided with a center of mass energy, which will denote ECM, near the rest energy of the Z boson, which is 91.2 GeV. This was ideal for making lots of Z bosons for study, and here lots means a few million for each of the four experiments. So these four LEP experiments collided electrons and positrons at center of mass energies in the neighborhood of 91.2 GeV. So 91.2 GeV is the rest energy of the Z boson. This is equal to mz times c squared, where mz is the mass of the Z. This expression might make a little more sense if you've heard of E equals mc squared. Now, I should note that in these diagrams, we're using the convention that antiparticles are drawn with the direction of their arrow reversed. So you can think of this electron and positron as coming in from the left and going right, but the arrow on the E plus, the positron, is reversed because it's considered the antiparticle. Okay, so the E plus and E minus collide and they make a Z. And the Z immediately decays. So you don't see the Z in the detector. You only can possibly see the things that it can decay to. And here we're interested in the case where the Z decays to neutrinos. 
So the Z decays to a neutrino and an antineutrino. Now that neutrino and antineutrino can be electron type, muon type, tau type, and if there are other types of neutrinos that we don't know about, it can also be those types of neutrinos. Now we might ask, what can we learn about this neutrino and antineutrino that result from the decay of the Z? Unfortunately, neutrinos and antineutrinos interact extremely rarely with matter, and that means that they interact extremely rarely with the matter that our particle detectors are made of. If a particle doesn't interact with our particle detector, we can't see it. So for all practical purposes, this neutrino and antineutrino are invisible. Okay, so if the process E plus E minus goes to Z, goes to neutrino, antineutrino, occurred in the ADLO detectors, we wouldn't be able to see it. If we can't see the process, how do we study it? Okay, so let's say that we collide electrons and positrons and produce Z bosons. And let's say that the Z decays to something we can see, so visible particles. These particles might be quarks, or they might be the charged leptons, so the electron or the muon or the tau. Whenever a Z is produced, we'll measure the mass of the system of its decay products. So we'll measure the mass of the system of visible particles. From energy momentum conservation, the mass of the system of decay products will always be related to the center of mass energy of the incoming electron-positron pair. So the mass of the system of decay products is going to equal ECM, that was the center of mass energy, divided by C squared. Also from energy momentum conservation, the mass of the system of decay products is also the mass of the intermediate state, which here is the Z boson. So now let's imagine that we evenly vary the center of mass energy from, say, 85 GeV to 97 GeV, around the mass of the Z boson times C squared. Whenever a Z is produced, we'll measure the mass of its decay products. Now you might expect that when we measure the mass of the system of decay products from this Z boson, we always get a mass of Mz the mass of the Z boson, which equals 91.2 GeV over C squared. Equivalently, you might expect we produce Zs only when the center of mass energy is equal to Mz times C squared, which is equal to 91.2 GeV. But that's not what happens. While there is a peak at 91.2 GeV over C squared in the mass, the decay products of the Z bosons have a range of masses. The distribution has a non-zero width. This width that we're talking about is not due to experimental error. Now, there is experimental error on top of this effect, but that's not what we're talking about here. If you try to measure the mass of a particle that has a finite lifetime, you will not always get the same result. The quantity that we call mz, which is equal to 91.2 GeV over C squared, is the location of the peak of this distribution. This is an intrinsic feature of particles like the z, which have finite lifetimes. The shorter the particle's lifetime, the wider the mass distribution. And this is a manifestation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So roughly speaking, the more ways that the Z can decay, the shorter its lifetime will be. And the shorter its lifetime is, the wider the distribution of the mass 
of its decay products. The shape of the mass distribution is affected by a parameter that we call gamma z, which is called the width of the z. It affects both how wide and how high the distribution is. And the more ways the z can decay, the larger gamma z will be. Okay, so what if the visible z decays were the only ways that it could decay? So if there were no neutrinos at all? Then we would get a mass distribution of the decay products that looks like this. We can also consider the case where the z can decay to those visible states plus the three standard model neutrinos. We've plotted the mass distribution for that case in black. We can see that compared to the no neutrino case, the curve is shorter and and additionally, in comparison to its height, it's also fatter than the no neutrino case. We can also consider a scenario where there are the three standard model neutrinos, and then there's also one additional neutrino. We've plotted the mass distribution for that case in blue, and you can see that it is shorter yet. Okay, so now we can give a simplified description of the method for how to experimentally measure the number of light neutrinos. So first, we have to experimentally measure this mass distribution. Second, we use the shape of this mass distribution to get the value of gamma z, the width of the z. Next, we subtract out the contributions to gamma z that arise from final states that we can observe. So we subtract out the contributions arising from the z decaying to quarks, or e plus e minus, mu plus mu minus, or tau plus tau minus. After you subtract that out, you take what is left, and you divide it by the contribution to gamma z that is expected in the standard model from a single type of neutrino and that will give you the number of light neutrinos. From this, the experiments get that the number of light neutrinos is 2.9963 plus or minus 0.0074. Now, this technique works only if the neutrinos are light enough that the Z can decay to a neutrino and an antineutrino. The mass of the z is about 91.2 GeV over c squared, so this analysis is valid only if the neutrino has a mass less than mz over 2, which is about 45.6 GeV over c squared. So this is why we said at the beginning of the video that this experiment constrained the number of light neutrinos, where light neutrinos were neutrinos with masses less than about 45 GeV over c squared. Okay, so the number of light neutrino species is determined by parameters measured in E plus E minus collisions. If the Z had decayed to some other non-standard particle at a rate that is different from that to a species of neutrinos, it would be possible to get an experimental result that seemingly implies a non-integer number of neutrinos. But as it turns out, the result was in agreement with the standard model prediction. OK, so let's summarize. Here we've seen how the measured number of light neutrino species, instead of being an integer, is 2.9963 plus or minus 0 0.0074. The different species are not simply counted. Instead, the number of light neutrino species affects measurable characteristics of Z boson production and decay. And it is the measurement of these characteristics that leads to the experimental result.